Hello everyone and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to examine William Blake's original draft manuscript version of the poem London, originally composed in 1792, and his later amendments for the published version of 1794, in order to expose how the poem became more explicitly radical in terms of the context of the French Revolution. So I'm going to start by briefly outlining some context of the French Revolution and Blake's wearing of the bonnet rouge. And then I'm going to move on to some close textual work comparing crucial differences between the original draft manuscript of the poem and the final published version of William Blake's poem, London. Before I forget, do please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and do give the video a big thumbs up by pressing the like button. William Blake's poem London was first published as part of his Songs of Experience collection from 1794 and it was published in tandem with the Songs of Innocence. You can see page one there is the title page. London then is a poem of experience and what should we take that experience to mean, particularly when it's taken as being oppositional to innocence and that's something to keep in mind as you read through the poem and as you analyse the poem for yourselves. So the poem itself reads, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. I want to begin by looking at some of the contexts of the poem. For those living in Britain in the 1790s, the French Revolution, even though it happened over the Channel, was inescapable. In the early 1790s, the French Revolution was a symbol of hope for change, for overturning the status quo, which seemed to continue to enrich some elite people at the expense of many, indeed the vast majority, of others. The French Revolution symbolised and apparently championed liberty, equality, so equality, fraternity, which we might say means friendship. You can see the motto on this propaganda poster of 1793, promoting the French First Republic, which uses the slogan, unity and indivisibility of the Republic, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. And William Blake was initially a supporter of the French Revolution before the violence and the bloodshed and the violent disillusionment that went along with it. We might think of the reign of terror period in particular. At the top of the 1793 poster you can see a red cap. The red cap or bonnet rouge has its roots in classical antiquity and was used by Romans to symbolise freedom from tyranny. The red cap was taken up symbolically by the French revolutionaries and in the summer of 1792 when Blake was first drafting the first version of the poem London, Blake wore the bonnet rouge as he walked around the streets of London to declare publicly and indeed somewhat dangerously his open support for the French Revolution. To give you some context of William Blake's own life and his engagement with the ideals of the French Revolution, here is an extract from Alexander Gilchrist's biography of William Blake, which was first published in 1863. Gilchrist got much of his material from interviewing William Blake's surviving friends and acquaintances, so from first-hand accounts from those who knew Blake himself. And before I read this, we might remember the image within the poem runs in blood down palace walls. That's a explicitly violent image talking about blood 
and the palace. Blake in that line is, is skating on thin ice there. So keep that in mind then as we read through this biography. Blake was himself an ardent member of the New School, a vehement Republican and sympathiser with the revolution, hater and contemner of kings and kingcraft. Down to his latest days, Blake always avowed himself a liberty boy, a faithful son of liberty, and would jokingly urge in self-defence that the shape of his forehead made him a Republican. To him at this date, as to ardent minds everywhere, the French Revolution was the herald of the millennium, of a new age of light and reason. He courageously donned the famous symbol of liberty and equality, the bonnet rouge, in open day, and philosophically walked the streets with the same on his head. He is said to have been the only one of the set who had the courage to make that public profession of faith. Brave as a lion at heart was this meek spiritualist. Decorous, Godwin, that's William Godwin, Thomas Holcroft and Wiley Thomas Paine. So Godwin, Holcroft and Paine were what we might now call political activists who supported the French Revolution and we'll talk a bit more about Tom Paine later. However much they might approve paused before running the risk of a church and king mob at their heels. That is, they did not have the courage to go around wearing this symbol of support for the French Revolution openly, the Bonnet Rouge. Gilchrist's point then is that Blake publicly professed his faith in the cause of the French Revolution. And I want to look in close detail at the poem itself to interrogate William Blake's politics within the poem, especially how it relates to the French Revolution. This is the draft original manuscript of the poem held in the British Library. It's always fascinating to see the way in which poets edit and redraft and rework their poetry. And as critics, it allows us to see the various ideas that coloured the final published version of a text. So it's always really good if you can to look at the editorial changes that an author makes to their own texts. I'm going to start with the poem's opening two lines and consider the move from dirty to chartered. This is from the 1792 manuscript. I wander through each dirty street near where the dirty Thames does flow. And he amended that in the published version from 1794 in the Songs of Experience to I wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. So in the first version of the poem, Blake describes the streets of London and the Thames as dirty. London's streets and its water were literally dirty, even filthy. And remember that this was before London had sewers and universal running water, for example. So waste management was a huge problem. Also, there was the dirt and the soot of the smoke coming from every house and building. And the word dirty, of course, also suggests moral soiling, staining and grime and ties into the later line symbolic image of the blackening church. Blake had originally written blackens over the church's walls, but had crushed it out and had altered the line to every blackening church appalls. And you can see why he made that change, because the word appalls focuses on the morality. There's a, a human interpretation of the degeneration, corruption and moral blackening of the church. But the original line blackens over the church's walls implies the covering of dirt, literally and figuratively, just as the dirt blackens over London and the Thames. Given that Blake amended the reference to the blackening church, this suggests the importance of the image within the poem, that Blake wanted to ensure that he got that imagery right. London, the poem as a whole, describes the physical as well as spiritual turmoil and suffering within the capital city. Prostitutes with sexually transmitted diseases, so we've got the harlot's curse, which is syphilis, Children working as chimney sweepers, and we've got the chimney sweepers cry, and the symbolism there, of course, is the exploitation of children that literally kill them by damaging their lungs so they didn't grow properly, the blackening of childhood innocence. And symbolically, this is a very useful image for Blake. He uses the image of the child chimney sweep elsewhere 
in The Songs of Innocence and The Songs of Experience on page 12 in Innocence and on page 37 in Experience and compares the two figures. We've also got the dual meaning of the word cry. So we've got crying as in advertising for work, but also it conjures up images of babies and infants crying, which the chimney sweep boys were little more than. And we've got the babies born to mothers who can't look after them. All this is very much in keeping with the word dirty. But the word dirty does not have the political connotations of the word chartered. Chartering was a process of corporate ownership which accelerated in the 18th century and which effectively transferred public land and rights of way into private self-enriching hands. And it's not unlike the enclosure acts which were happening in the country at the same time. And the word chartered was laden with political implications, especially in the 1790s. For those opposed to chartering, it symbolised the taking away of natural born rights of all people in order to give them to a privileged few. Chartering was aristocratical and anti-democratic and not at all in line with the ideas espoused by those in favour of the French Revolution. Thomas Paine, who I mentioned earlier in Gilchrist's biography, The Life of William Blake, argued against charters in his infamous and revolutionary polemical text, The Rights of Man, which was very, very popular and therefore was a real worry to the state, those who wished to maintain the status quo. So in part one, in 1791, Paine declared that William the Conqueror, obviously a royal conqueror, William the Conqueror and his descendants parceled out the country in this manner and bribed one part of it by what they called charters to hold the other parts of it the better subjected to their will. He says a bit later, every chartered town is an aristocratical monopoly in itself. So he's directly linking the taking away of rights of everybody to the royal family and the monarchical system. He then reiterated this in part two of The Rights of Man, which was published the next year, 1792. I begin with charters and corporations. It is a perversion of terms to say that a charter gives rights. It operated by a contrary effect, that of taking rights away. Rights are inherently in all the inhabitants, but charters, by annulling those rights in the majority, leave the rights by exclusion in the hands of a few. But charters and corporations have a more extensive evil effect. They lessen the common rights of national society. We can see expressly political connotations then of the word charter, and indeed to use such language was dangerous. As I've said, Paine's The Rights of Man was a very popular text, so popular that it worried the government into trying to suppress Paine and his writings. Paine was so worried that he fled to France and was tried in absentia and was convicted of seditious libel against the crown, the punishment for which was hanging, which Paine avoided by never returning to Britain again. In changing his description of London and the Thames from dirty to chartered then, Blake is making a decidedly and political, even radical statement. William Blake suggests that the city is a place where people's natural rights have been taken away from them by political machinations, further symbolised in Blake's image of the Thames being chartered too. We might now think of a river as a peaceful, natural, almost rural image. But in the 18th century, when William Blake was living and writing in London, the Thames was the mercantile heart of the city, with goods being delivered and transported and bought and sold all day long. And here is a scene from London Bridge, for example. I won't go into this in too much detail here today, as I've spoken about the symbolism of the Thames in another video, that is the symbolism of the Thames as the heart of mercantile empire, when I was talking about William Wordsworth's poem composed upon Westminster Bridge. But Blake's image of a chartered Thames highlights the perversion of the current system if even nature can be so corrupted, can be so bought and sold. 
In referring to each chartered street and the chartered Thames then, William Blake is not just saying they are dirty, but is pointing the finger at who is to blame for the degeneration of the city. The point then is not just that the city is dirty, but that it is made morally dirty by the abuses of charters and corporations and the enslavement of the masses that they necessarily bring with them. What this change in the opening line also means is that William Blake clearly intended us to read the rest of the poem through a political lens and makes the poem more subversive and provocative. I now want to consider William Blake's famous image, Mind Forged Manacles, which were originally written as German forged links, which doesn't quite have the same ring to it. German here perhaps has two meanings. First, the House of Hanover, or the royal family. George I ascended to the throne in 1714, and then the royal line went through George II, and in the 1790s, George III was on the throne. The implication here is that the charters, and remember that Thomas Paine had linked them to William the Conqueror, so another royal, symbolically a conqueror and enslaver, of the British masses continue to be perpetuated by the current aristocratic regime. Second, German might refer to the Hessian mercenaries who were hired by the British state ostensibly in case of French Revolution, but also to ensure public order in the event of social unrest and rioting among the home population. Symbolically, they were people who were hired and paid, mercenaries, doing it for the money, to suppress revolutionary spirit. Symbolically, people fighting for money to suppress people fighting for freedom. Originally then, William Blake's poem London was inflected with imagery of the explicitly externally imposed curtailing of freedom, German forged, but Blake replaced this image with a more internal image, mind forged. The emphasis shifts from externally forced political oppression in the form of hired mercenaries paid to suppress revolutionary spirit to internally imposed restrictions on the mind. But seeing the two different versions in the manuscript, in the draft version, allows us to think about how those two external and internal were operating on Blake's mind as he made the poem, the vacillation between the external oppressions and internal oppressions. In The Social Contract, which is an important philosophical tract, which was published in 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau had opened the text with the famous line, man is born free and yet is universally in irons, more usually translated as in chains. And Blake develops this notion by articulating in Mind Forged Manacles that some of the heaviest chains are in fact those imposed by one's own mind and that releasing one's mind from the shackles of self-imposed oppression is the first step to freedom. And equally, oppressing the minds of the masses is the way to maintain power for those who wish to maintain power. And the form that Blake forges the poem into in this stanza beautifully mirrors and enhances the meaning. The encircling effect of the sounds and repetition are like the encircling and enclosing of the manacles as if there's no escape. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. So we've got the repetition of the opening three lines in every, in every, in every but also the repetition within the lines too. So that in this short four line quatrain, you have the word every five times. It's almost as if the speaker is forging those manacles in his own mind by seeing woe and misery in every face. So the sound and the rhythm support the idea of being enclosed, being oppressed by these thoughts that the speaker is having. And really, this line works two ways. Whose are the mind forged manacles? Are they the speakers, the mind forged manacles I hear, 
of his own mind or are they the mind forged manacles of those he looks at that he kind of imagines that he's hearing the clanking of the chains of those that he is observing of those that he's looking at perhaps of course it could mean both What's also important within the poem is the idea of hearing. The narrative I, the speaker, and the reader too, hear the suffering in the poem. And we hear it in the rhythm that I mentioned earlier in every, in every, in every. And furthermore, the sounds of the poem, its aural effects, are like hearing the metal chains clanking. And the idea of hearing within the poem is clearly important. We have the triple cry of man and infant and later chimney sweep. We have every voice. We have the soldier's sigh. We have the harlot's curse. So as I said earlier, that could refer to the pox, to syphilis, to a sexually transmitted disease, but also the harlot's curse, as in the, the harlot's swearing, the harlot's making a curse. And then we've got the sound blasts, blasts the newborn infant's tear. Importantly, also, we have the speaker twice say, I hear. The mind forged manacles, I hear, but through the midnight streets, I hear. And I think it's important that the speaker hears rather than sees. You might automatically think it's more likely to say the mind forged manacles, I see. But the speaker doesn't say that he or she sees them, but hears them. You know, this London that Blake is creating is a very noisy city. So you've seen the blackening and now you're hearing the, the pain and the misery as well. And these two lines that I mentioned of the speaker saying I hear are separated by a stanza. A stanza which Blake amended from his original draft poem. And he amended it so that it forms an acrostic of H E A are here. These mind forged manacles operate both on the speaker and those people that the speaker witnesses. The speaker cannot escape his or her own thoughts about the oppression and suffering of the people, just as they cannot escape it themselves, seemingly. The word manacles, furthermore, is important. In replacing the word links with the word manacles, William Blake again made the poem London more radical. According to Peter Ackroyd, the word manacles, and indeed the word charted, were radical code words of the period, which were directed at the oppression of the authorities. And perhaps the word manacle particularly became associated with the French Revolution because the etymology of the word manacle derives from the Anglo-Norman Old French. Samuel Taylor Coleridge would use the word manacles later in the 1790s, also in relation to the French Revolution. In 1798, Coleridge wrote France an ode when he began to feel that the French had acted contrary to the original principles of the French Revolution. He wrote, the sensual and the dark rebel in vain, slaves by their own compulsion. In mad game they burst their manacles and wear the name of freedom graven on a heavier chain. O oh, liberty, with profitless endeavour, have I pursued thee many a weary hour. Coleridge, like William Blake, uses the idea of self-imposed manacles when talking about freedom and oppression in relation to the French Revolution. He says slaves by their own compulsion. Returning to William Blake's London poem, in the revised published version of the poem London, the individual, and not just the state then, carries responsibility, it seems, for his or her own enslavement, and also concomitantly then, responsibility for their own liberation too. For William Blake, people forge their own chains when they mentally accept their oppression. The word manacle has a decided political inflection which colours the meaning of the phrase mind-forged manacles. 
Blake then is not just making a point about the power of imagination, which this phrase is often taken to support, that is to support the theory that Blake's idea is that one should just throw off the shackles of mental oppression and unleash the creative potential and energy of the imagination. And this is often taken to speak more broadly for romanticism in general. And I'm not saying that Blake isn't saying that, but that the determinedly contextual and political elements of Blake's image should not be overlooked either. The poem as a whole, as a song of experience, asks us to consider which causes which. Does experience lead to one forging one's mind manacles? Or do one's mind manacles perpetuate experience? Or do both operate continuously on each other? Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you found it useful to unpick some of the explicitly political contextualisations of William Blake's word choices in his fabulous poem, London. If you like what I do here on my channel, then do subscribe and hit the notification bell. It means that you'll see my new weekly videos when they're uploaded. And let me know if you've liked the video by giving it a big thumbs up. And do carry on the conversation in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Blake's marvellous and expressly political poem.